Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Beggar Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And it's time to dig into Tremors. This has been a request for quite a while, and this October I'd like to tackle the Tremors series of movies. It's the perfect time, October, home of Halloween, to feature a series of monster movies that fit perfectly. Or at least they did when they were still only four, and as I do my show every Wednesday, and there's four Wednesdays in October, it fit perfectly, and then they just had to release a fifth just now, so now it's gonna end up bleeding into October, and people are gonna think that I threw this together in the last minute just to fucking capitalize on the fact that they just came out with a new Tremors movie. Point of all is, this week we're going to be looking at the film that kicked the series off, Tremors, directed by Ron Underwood, perhaps the classic monster movie of the 90s. While Tremors didn't perform very well in theaters, video sales and rentals were off the charts. The basic concept is your good old monster movie plot, a small town, isolated from the rest of the world, is besieged by creatures never before seen, and must fight for survival. That's, uh... Pretty much it. So, let's take a look at Tremors and see if the basic monster movie formula holds up, or if the whole thing just ends up feeling a little shallow. Zing! The film opens up to introducing the two guys we'll be following throughout the story. Valentine, played by Kevin Bacon, and his older, wiser business partner, Earl, played by Fred Ward. They play off each other well as soon as we see them, making it relatively easy to take in the fact that they live their lives as low-pay labor in the small town of perfection. What's on the agenda for today? It's garbage day. Oh, man. I'm gonna get some jackass who thinks he's funny shooting at us again. It's obvious that neither of them care much for their life out in bumfuck nowhere, but before they can discuss it too much, Valentine makes a detour to give a friendly neighborhood welcome to the new grad student that just arrived, whom he hopes has a few specific features. Long blonde hair, big green eyes, world-class breasts, ass that won't quit, and legs that go all the way up. First things first, Bacon, find out if you can say hello without her calling the police. With your exuberance, that may be more difficult than it has to be. <sighs> Damn it, it turns out the college student is not bestowed with such endowments that would allow them to be able to coast through life on looks alone, making getting a college education moot. Such a tragedy. Nevertheless, this is Rhonda Lebeck, played by Finn Carter. She's doing some legwork for the university scientists to earn some credits towards her seismology degree. Well, I've been getting some really strange readings. I mean, the school's had these machines up here for three years, and we've never recorded anything like this. So either we're going to experience an oil geyser Beverly Hillbilly style, or a horrible subterranean monsters are going to show up and kill everybody. That's yeah, still a little fuzzy. That's enough silly exposition for now, so the two of them leave their work, driving into town where we meet up with several more faces for this picture. Melvin, played by a young Robert Jane, Walter Chang, played by the legendary Victor Wong, and our doomsday preppers, Bert and Heather Gummer, played by Michael Gross and Reba McIntyre, respectively. Well, you worry. You're gonna have a heart attack before you get a chance to survive World War III. We'll see, we'll see. Joke's on him. The walls of my bomb shelter are made out of millions of crushed Benadryl tablets. Just chip off a little bit and I'll survive that heart attack, too. The thing is, as the town has such a low population, there's not much time to spend introducing everyone, so we just watch them doing mundane labor. Normally in a horror movie, this would signify that somebody is about to die horribly, but not so today. We just get to see how much shit these two have to deal with before they finally quit. You know how close I am to leaving this place right now? I'll call that little bluff. How close? Oh, oh, yeah, oh. About 500 gallons or so. Indeed, while years of hard labor for meager wages was just inconvenient, having to take a midday shower was just going too far. So Val and Earl pack up, ready to leave for the prosperous land of Bixby. That is, if the side quest dialogues would stop interrupting them. We're not delivering firewood anymore. We're heading for Bixby permanent. Oh, sure. Oh my god, you really are! Well, in that case, you should take this crate to that mayor. And also, along the way, there's an aardvark infestation, so if you kill a bunch of them and prove you did by collecting ten or so aardvark tails, that'd be mighty fine of you. This would be Nancy Sterngood, played by Charlotte Stewart, and her daughter Mindy, played by an extremely young Ariana Richards. You know, Lex from Jurassic Park. The point is, while the guys want to leave, Nancy tempts them with a preview of the quest reward. I'll throw in lunches. And beer. Oh god, if she throws an Xbox Live, I don't know if I can take it. Joke's on her, it's 1990. The Xbox hasn't been invented yet. Now there's nothing, and I mean nothing between us and Bixby, but nothing. How long till they stop for something? Even shorter if you count it from the time when they decided to stop. 
They halted their progress because the two of them just couldn't help picking up a good Samaritan side quest, helping out a local who, through some twist of fate, has found himself up on a high voltage tower. Of course, he won't come down when called, so Val has to go and wake the guy up. This may prove more difficult than anticipated. As Edgar is but a corpse! And a very well-preserved one didn't even get his eyes pecked out by buzzards. Man, that PG-13 rating is something else. Died of dehydration. Thirst. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. I figured up there he could have got an unlimited supply of joke cola. Dr. Jim, played by Conrad Bachman, says that no matter how weird it sounds that Edgar would just climb up that thing and stay up there three or more days required to die of dehydration, that's his diagnosis and he's sticking to it. In case this has been far too hard to piece together, we jump over to old Fred, played by Michael Dan Wagner, to figure out what exactly the problem is. Things in the ground killing people! Or, well, potentially killing people. And come to think of it, Fred was the first one to die. Edgar was just scared up there on the pole, like, for a few days until he died. They didn't actually kill him directly, so... That means they waited up there and then they grabbed... Actually, this just makes it more confusing. Now that Val and Earl finished going back into town to drop off Edgar's body, they head back out, but again get sidetracked when they notice that Fred's sheep are slaughtered. And Fred himself. Oh, Jesus! What the hell's going on? I mean, what the hell is going on? It's the monster movie. You gotta establish people, places, and horrible deaths. Thus, they run like hell right back into town. Better get the hell out of here. There's a killer on the loose. What? A murderer, man, a real psycho. He's, 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 he's cutting people's heads off. I'm not kidding. Well, fair enough, but couldn't you, you know, escape towards Bixby and then call the police and, you know, do all that stuff and, you know, personal safety and everything? Just, just asking. Of course, the road workers don't believe him, but we do get to watch these unimportant characters continue to engage in mundane tasks. Therefore... Wow. Just... wow? What the fuck do you think that is? Strawberry jam? In his dumbfounded stupor, he doesn't realize his ankle is caught up in the cable, leading to both his own untimely death and that of his partner. Never mind all that, though. Val and Earl have made it back to town just in time to find out the phone lines are down, and introduce two more characters. Nestor, played by Richard Marcus, and Tony Gennaro is Miguel. Point is, now they have to turn right back around and drive to Bixby to contact the police. Uh, there's a teeny little problem this time. Is there some higher force at work here? <laughs> I was gonna ask the same question in regards to how the hell you managed to not run out of gas in that thing. I would assume they could just drive around the road, but I can't see the area so much, so that might be too presumptuous. The point is, after they figure out that the road workers are auditioning for the role of a live-action meat wad, it's time to rush back to town as fast as they can go. Jesus, I don't believe this. Get hung up. It's not the most badass way to start barrel-assing your way down the road. In any case, it beats the engine refusing to turn over for the umpteenth time. Eventually, they get the car to move and return to town, but news of the road being out is not nearly as interesting as what everyone else has noticed. Oh, Bart, be careful. Yeah, it's real. And now, this small American town learns the true horror of Cialis. This phallic predator is dead, but no one knows what kind of creature it is. However, if it is responsible for the string of deaths, they come to a startling conclusion. Just one of these could need a friend in his flock sheep. So you think there are more of them out there? I fucking hope so. We're only 20 minutes in. With this in mind, everyone stumbles to figure out how to survive this terror, and make money off it at the same time, of course. But with the phones out, the road out, and no way to radio for help thanks to the surrounding mountains, oh, well, there's not too many options. We got the cliffs to the north, mountains to the east and the west. That's why I had me settled here in the first place. Geographic isolation. Baton, this is the only county in the state that doesn't have some dogmatic law against a man's love of his bovines. While over 30 miles is far too long to walk, and the cars are out, because they figure someone could ride the Bixby on Walter's horses. Who's best on a horse? Are y'all just saying that because I'm wearing a cowboy hat? Fucking prejudicial, I swear. 
It doesn't take much to convince these guys to saddle up and ride into the sunset to save the town. Also helps that they get food, water, and weapons for their quest. Along the way, they discover that the doctor and his wife were brutally killed in a scene that I felt wasn't important enough to show. But before they can make it to the next city, their horses start to freak out, buck up, and throw them to the ground. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, what about my horses? What's the it's like hentai if it were invented south of the border. What the hell are they? Sons of bitches. I am a professor and son of bitchology. They fight the creatures off, but soon find to be in over their heads. Must be a million of them! Nope, just one. Which finally reveals the monster for this movie, which actually underwent several changes in pre-production. You would think that Giant Killer Worm would be pretty straightforward, but when their initial design had a hard exoskeleton that would slide back to reveal a soft interior, well, they kind of changed that instead of going with the name for the movie Attack of the Sand Dingies. Unfortunately, without their horses and finding the rifles only piss these things off, the guys run like hell. On the plus side, there's a concrete trench for them to escape into. He's dead. And despite being jive fucking enormous and able to burrow through dirt fast as fuck, a couple of inches of concrete is more than enough to just kill these fuckers, it seems. Now, of course, would be the best time for Rhonda to pop up and rejoin this movie. What's going on? Did you notice anything weird a minute ago? I mean, it just happened. I just like how she had to have been close enough to hear them screaming earlier, or at the very least heard the gunshots, and finding them in that ditch, she's just like, hey, how's the weather? With her help, they expose and examine the corpse of the beast, a fantastic creature unlike anything the world has ever seen. Except, you know, giant fucking worms. But never mind, this is truly a momentous occasion in science. There's just one little problem. The way I figure it, there's three more of these things. What? No, this is the first movie. You only do one of the first movie and save that multiplier shtick for the sequels. Not like they have much time to question this theory, as before long they get a very clear hint to its validity. Looks like the one that grabbed our truck! Damn it, why'd you have to point out a defining feature of the thing? Now it's going to survive all the way to the climax and you know it. Of course, our protagonists may not be so lucky thanks to their current predicament. While the creature cannot kill them as they have perched atop a large boulder, they can't get off said boulder without the creature killing them. Doesn't he have a home to go to? Though I'm still confused, they gorge on entire flocks of sheep and herds of cattle and then person after person, one after the other, and then they just kind of camp out for a few days, just waiting. Are they hungry or aren't they? Luckily for them, Rhonda figures out that there's a convenient stack of wooden poles right next to the boulders, and even more lucky for them, large boulders spaced just far enough apart for them to be able to pole vault between them on the way to their truck, which also happens to be right next to a boulder. Thus, they are able to escape and head back into town, where we can get down to the important part. Grilling Rhonda for failing as her job as cliche scientist in this monster movie. Look, these creatures are absolutely unprecedented. Yeah, but where do they come from? Yeah. For the entire movie, where they come from and what they're called actually goes unsaid. And personally, I like that about Tremors. I mean, when you get down to it, once they grab you and drag you underground and start chewing on your ass, such frivolous details really don't matter. Of course, that doesn't mean that these characters don't let that bother them. They're suckoids, boys. I like snakeoids. Or they hold on to you from the hem of your jeans. Hemorrhoids! Rhonda is able to explain that these subterranean hunters track their prey by feeling vibrations. Hey, so like we don't vibrate, right? Just have to stand still, you know? Hold your breath and stop pumping blood, and then they can't kill you. In frustration at all this speculative bullshit, Valentine points out that they have to prepare, because the worms are coming, and if they just stand around bickering, the monsters will come up from the ground and grab them too! That's what I like. Graboid! That's it, Graboid! Or maybe, if they use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate... Polaroids! It still stands they need to prepare for the worst, as they don't know exactly how long they have until the creatures reach town. Not 
Not very long at all. Turns out the critters just couldn't resist grabbing Melvin's ball. Wait. Unfortunately, the kid survives this attack, while everyone else manages to run to escape the creature. Well, almost everyone. Mindy, get off the boat, so, three monsters left, and there's people all over town, completely unprepared, just waiting to be eaten. What exactly do they get? Hmm. I'm more impressed that her balance was so damn good the thing stayed standing even after Kevin Bacon tackled her. That doesn't mean the problem is over, of course. So we get to watch everyone panic as they realize that more than one of these things has reached town, and they must run! right into barbed wire. But don't worry, the monsters are nothing if not a fan of suspense, working on killing her as slowly as possible. Now you're fan. Look, I know you probably won't get another shot of this, but now's not the time. But it does free her from the wire of death, and allows them to evade the suddenly lethargic predators. After they collect themselves, it's time to come up with a new plan to escape the valley, which they can't quite figure out before this happens. I mean, yeah, they were walking in boots on a hardwood floor this whole time, but you know, unless the Foley guy kicks in, it doesn't actually make sound. So that plan takes a backseat to the current crisis, surviving within the next five minutes. With that in mind, everyone rushes up to the rooftops. On the plus side, Bert and Heather finally return from their off-screen adventure, and while it's harder than it has to be, they establish radio communications with the guys in the main drag. Well, good, the Doomsday Preppers are in relative safety and can strategize with them about how to kill the worms. You know, so long as nobody just makes a ridiculous amount of noise for no apparent reason. Brass Tumbler! Hey, that'll do it. Quick question, though. What the fuck were you shooting at today that you wound up with so much spent brass in need of cleaning? Even better, they're in the basement, meaning this is the loudest fucking dinner bell these monsters have ever heard. That, combined with the fact that it takes them far too long to understand giant subterranean worms coming to kill you, this gets very dangerous very fast. Jesus Christ! How many times I gotta tell them it's Jesus Christ, we're all gonna die? Over. But they aren't going to die. Partly due to the giant fucking wall of guns, and the fact that they actually know how to use the damn things. Magazine! Yeah! <laughs> I can see why he married her. Once Bert gets his hand on that 500 Nitro Express elephant gun and realizes that, like Skaggs, you score a critical hit if you shoot him while their mouth is open, that spells the end for this fuckoid. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? Eh? You, you mean this isn't 301 Sun Street? God damn it, I should have made that left toy at Albuquerque. Be advised, however, there are two more, repeat, two more mother hoppers. And the fact that they dub over every single instance of fuck is kinda obvious and pretty roughly done. Well, except the first instance where they didn't dub over it at all. You know, when they killed the first worm. I, I, I edited that out of this review, didn't I? You know, fuck it, it seems pretty important now, so here it is. Fuck you! <laughs> uh, probably would have seemed even wonkier if they tried to dub over it with something like, Hump you! Unfortunately, while they know the creature's weak point, the thick hide plus the shield of dirt means they can't just shoot the motherfuckers while they burrow around the place. No time to dawdle, though, as the creatures are getting ever more insidious, messing with the integrity of the ground itself to knock the people off their homes, killing Nestor, the guy, and taking out Burton Heather's truck. However, using an unmanned tractor as a decoy, Val rushes towards the town's spare bulldozer as a means to transport everyone safely out of reach of the monsters. If that's how we're doing it, we're going prepared! I know he's a prepper, but damn, that's some forward thinking to bring his explosive mixtures and pipes and fuses to the roof earlier. After a little more arguing about caliber, barrel length, and ammo weight, they join the rest of the town in the giant heavy vehicle to ride to the mountains, to the solid granite the monsters cannot burrow through, and to freedom! At least that's the plan. Wait, wait, look out! We wouldn't be able to have our climax. While everyone is stranded in the bulldozer, they find out there's one thing they haven't tried just yet that may prove to be a solution to their problem. EXPLOSIONS! This doesn't kill them, mind you, but allows them to hurt the beasts from the surface, scattering them and giving them the opportunity to escape a quick death in a stranded vehicle and embrace a slow death stranded on a rock. We're not gonna pole vault out of here.
That's for damn sure. Hey, maybe if Bert packed the RPG, you guys can rocket jump. Or, considering he still has a few spare bombs, they can tempt the beasts with vibrations, toss a bomb out, and solve this problem the old-fashioned way. My god. The monsters are full of chili con queso. This is the best day of my life. But there is still one to go. Wouldn't you know it, it's the one with the divining characteristic that has been pestering them since the beginning. Problem is, it's also a hell of a lot smarter and realizes it can solve its own problems with explosions. Oh my god, it's got... I'm actually kind of surprised I didn't kill anybody. I mean, you don't need a huge body count, but you got nine people there, and one of them seems kind of pointless, and another's a jackass. While things are definitely bad for them, don't worry, they have one more bomb left, and Val has an idea. Rather than distract the beast so they can get to safety and die in a few days, he'll run like fuck to the convenient cliff, and then hit the motherfucker with a shockwave disorienting it, and sending it falling to its death. Crushing the beast under its own weight. Which, considering its subterranean pressure, really shouldn't be that big of a problem. And the shockwaves through the dirt would probably have caused more damage to them overall. I, uh... But the point is, it's dead! Therefore, happy ending! Most of the town survived, which is still really surprising to me. Val and Earl start musing about how much money this discovery will be worth, launching them well out of their life of maniac labor and low pay. Oh, and Valentine does the obvious thing and realizes that Rhonda, while not matching any of his criteria earlier, is the only woman who has truly won his heart. That and ripping her pants off earlier helped him preview the goods, and they aren't bad. Anyway, that was Tremors, and it's a really solid monster movie. While this genre is not known for being particularly high class, and indeed Kevin Bacon was very upset that his career had taken this turn while the movie was still in production, Tremor stands as an example of the genre that pretty much does everything right. Between the pacing, the setting, the setup, the characters, and the acting, all the pieces come together to form something that is truly memorable. While it doesn't ask big questions or examine the depths of the human psyche, it does give us a believable set of people to follow who are identifiable from the cliches they harken back to, but are still unique enough on their own that this movie doesn't come off like a cheap slasher flick just doing the numbers. The creature itself is very well done, of course, and interesting in that you don't see much of it, even though it's attacking people during the day out in the open. The subterranean aspect works well for unique qualities, horror, and cinematography. It's hard for me to really come up with negatives about Tremors, aside from the fact that at its heart it really is just a basic monster movie. That's exactly what it's trying to be, and it does a damn good job of it. But the genre is a very simple one. While it's a great movie, it's not likely to make many films you must watch before you die lists. It's high-class organic butter, perfectly salted popcorn entertainment, but still popcorn entertainment, coming in at four rating pointoids out of five. While it didn't do too well in theaters, the home release was such a massive success that it spawned three four sequels, and a TV series. I uh, probably won't be doing the TV series anytime soon, but I will be digging into all the rest of the Tremors movies this... Trem...October? This, uh... Octoberoids? Yeah, yeah, fuck it, I'm gonna review the movies. Anyway, thank you all for watching, I've been Deca Shadow, and remember, the explosive solution works perfectly fine across species.
bird. You asshole, there's no bullets in this gun. Got your movement, didn't you?